Hi everyone, my name is Suborn Alliance Perry from Gary's Dying Slab, and today we're going to be talking about quantum mechanics. Welcome back to quantum mechanics, and today is lecture number five. Today we're going to be talking about ladder operations. So what are ladder operations? Well, they're essentially ways we can find new solutions to the Schrodinger equation by essentially climbing up a ladder. And what we really mean by climbing up a ladder is multiplying an initial solution to the Schrodinger time independent Schrodinger equation that we already have, then we multiply it by a factor to get another solution. Then we multiply it again to get another solution. And so on and so on and so on. And theoretically, we can get infinitely many solutions this way. So, how are we going to do this? Well, let's start with the basis of this equation. We start with a time independent Schrodinger equation. And to give you a reminder of how it's derived, we take the regular Schrodinger equation. It should be fairly familiar by now. And then we use separation of variables by assuming psi is the product of a function of x and a function of time. Then we divide everything in this equation by psi. Then we plug in this assumption. Now, partial t psi, we ignore the function of x and only take the derivative of the function of t. Hence, the left-hand side has become solely a function of t. Meanwhile, the right-hand side We now take the derivative of f without regarding g. And suddenly, when we divide by the normal psi, the factor of g of t goes away. And then we're adding on to this minus u, and u is the potential, which is a function of x, which makes the right-hand side wholly a function of x. And two functions of different independent variables can't be equivalent unless, of course, both of them are equal to a constant. So I'm not going to explain the reason behind this because I've explained it like four times already. So this constant specifically we're going to denote as the energy, E. Now we've already solved this equation twice, so I'm going to skip over it, and we obtain the time independent Schrodinger equation by taking this and setting it equal to e. So I continue this way or that way? So. so we take h bar squared over 2m f prime prime of x over f of x minus u of x and set it equal to e x. Right? Oh, wait. Then you multiply both sides by f of x, and you get h bar squared over 2m f prime prime of x minus u of x f of x is equal to e f of x. OK, so now we're going to talk about u of x. So one of the most famous potentials that we can use is the quadratic potential. Now, recall the simple harmonic oscillator, the spring. We have that the force is equal to minus kx, the restoring force, by Hooke's law. And f is uh, m d squared x dt squared. So you have m f prime prime of x plus 
or more like x prime prime t for the moment. K, x of t, is equal to zero. Now, this is obviously a very easy equation to solve, as we assume x of t is equal to e to the rt. Uh, we can actually assume it's equal to e to the rt multiplied by some constant, but uh, sure. So then we plug that in here, and what do we get? We get m a e to the rt r squared plus k e to the rt is a e to the rt is equal to zero. So the a e to the rt part gets canceled out, and you eventually get r is equal to i rad k over n. This is the frequency, and that implies the solution to this equation is x of t is equal to cosine of omega t. All right. So you also probably know that, well, you should know, potential, the negative derivative of potential with respect to position is equal to force. The force here is minus kx. So you erase the minus from both sides, then you take the integral with respect to position, and suddenly you get that u, the spring potential, is half kx squared. So, this might make you skeptical. How do we know that every single potential follows this? And of course, not every potential is simple harmonic. But, near a minimum, just about every potential is simple harmonic. So let's draw something like this. Even more non-harmonic. And you can still see the rough shape of a parabola whose minimum is at the minimum of this function. Why is that formally? We can't just use approximations here. We're building up a whole theory. So, u at any point can be written as a Taylor series. Now, we're going to take the Taylor series centered at the site of this minimum, x0. Now that Taylor series is going to be uh, u of x0 plus u prime of x0 multiplied by x minus x0 plus one half u double prime of x0 x minus x0 squared plus higher order terms. And it just continues on and on and on and on. So now, how does this resemble a parabola in any way? Well, here's the trick. U of x0, if we add a constant to this guy, this does not change the physical system at all. If we assume u of x, and if we replace u of x with u of x plus a constant. Because the only thing that really affects the system is force, f, which is minus du dx. But n is also m e to the rest of the equation. And that's not affected by adding a constant, because if you add a constant, that goes to zero, and you take this derivative. So we can easily make that constant minus the value of u at the minimum. And this disappears without anything changing in the physical system. And the fact that we've chosen this Taylor series to be centered at a minimum allows us to disappear u prime of x0 or the force at x0. Since it's at a minimum, u prime has to be zero. So that means that the only terms remaining are the second order and higher terms. And if you cut out all the higher order terms, it's go away very quickly because of the increasing inverse factorial proportion. Then 
this becomes pretty much the parabola. And what is this u prime prime of x naught? Well, for the spring potential, it's going to be k. Now, when we're talking quantum systems, we want to not go with the spring potential, and instead, oh no, sorry, we do not want to go with the spring constant. We don't want to think of this as a literal physical spring with stiffness. So, we instead substitute back in m omega squared. And you can very quickly see where this comes from. The u squared both sides here and solve for k. Okay, so the quantum problem is solving the, uh, the time independent Schrodinger equation when you have this potential. And specifically, we just let x naught be equal to zero. So we're solving a potential that looks more like this. Oh, so how do we actually solve that potential? This is the positive. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to write this out actually as d squared dx squared f and add that to u of x, which is now half m omega squared x squared multiplied by f again. And that's equal to e f of x. So now, initially, things look promising, because all of these terms are mul multiplicative and contain an f at the end. So you think, what if we just factor it out and cancel? then things will be happy, right? But then you come back to reality and realize that this guy is an operator, a double derivative. It has no meaning if it's not being applied to a function. We can't just disappear at that fact. So, hmm, what else can we do with this? Well, since we're working in complex numbers anyway, complex numbers give us a nice way to factor a squared plus b squared is just a plus id multiplied by a minus id. What if we try to do that? Well, we still have to be careful because this is an operator. Let's test this out on some test function. So the big question now is h bar squared over 2m d squared dx squared plus half m omega squared x squared of some test function, let's call it f of x, big F, is this equal to h bar over 2, the square root of 2m d dx plus 1, uh, 1 over 2i, which actually makes it minus half m rad m omega squared x squared i multiplied by h bar over the square root of 2m d dx plus half rad omega, oh sorry, rad m omega x i f of x. And next time, we're going to show that this actually is not equal to this. But there's a good side to the story. This is actually equal to this if you add a secret constant. And next time, we're going to finish off this story by figuring out what that secret constant is. Thank you, everybody, for watching.